Welcome to Washington DC. The AGU4 meeting is taking over the nation's capital and AGU TV is here to join in. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to day one of AGU TV. The AGU 4 meeting is the largest earth and space meeting in the whole world and we're here to bring you all the very latest news. So let's kick off this centennial meeting. Today we're taking you to Lisa Jackson's keynote address. We're touring universities and organisations doing cutting edge work in science and later on we have an interview with the AGU 4 meeting programme committee chair. You're not going to want to miss a beat. Absolutely delighted now to be joined by uh, Emily Osborne. Emily, welcome. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about the uh, Arctic Report Card. What is it? So the Arctic Report Card is a report that NOAA puts together each year um, that reflects on the conditions that the Arctic has experienced in the last calendar year. So this is the 13th year that we've been pulling the report together and we bring scientists from all over the world to contribute to this report. So we're really getting a state of the environment, what's gone on in, in 2018 and this year. And what does the report card show this year? So this year we're continuing to report on what we call vital signs. So we check in on um, things like surface air temperature, sea ice extent, the Greenland ice sheet. And this year, um, again, we've had record warm temperatures. So we have the second warmest year on record. Um, and that observational record started in the year 1900. And then another interesting story that emerged this year was in the sea ice story. So we have um, these winter sea ice extents that are just not growing to quite the extent that they had in previous years. So we have the second lowest winter sea ice extent that happened in 2018. And another um, interesting story in the sea ice uh, is, is unfolding in the Bering Strait region. So the Bering Strait um, is, is really just not experiencing the ice cover that it has in the past and that ecosystem is really seeing these really big changes as a result of that. So you've been doing this for 13 uh, years yes. now. So what have you seen over the course of that period of time? So we're seeing that these, these changes continue to mount. That's, that's our tagline for this year. So this, this warming trend continues to emerge and we're seeing these, these new issues come out um, that we really weren't anticipating. So one of the stories that we feature in the Arctic Report Card this year is this increasing prevalence of harmful algal blooms. And those harmful algal blooms are um, emerging in the Arctic as we have these warming sea surface temperatures and those blooms are, are starting to occur in places where we really haven't seen them before. And so this is a new issue that we're really focusing on the coast of Alaska and the SA and the Arctic Report Card this year. This is a new issue that these communities that, that really live off of um, these marine ecosystems and, and harvest food from the ocean are, are being faced with as a result of, of these warming um, issues. So there are a number of different um, kind of emerging threats that are coming as a result of this warming and that's really what this long-term report card is focusing on. Final question is for a lot of us uh, watching uh, uh, in on uh, this, these are big issues that yeah. you're uh, talking about. What, what can we do to help? I think as the science community, the thing that we need to continue to do is to continue to make these observations, to continue to contribute to these long-term time series, to creating um, a fidelity in in what our observations are and really just showing that these changes, we, we really can't, um, there's no argument that the change is happening. There might be a question of what the driver actually is um, and what you want to call it, but these changes are, are indeed happening and, and as a science community, I think we're contributing to improving that understanding, improving that awareness and getting the story out there and making sure that everyone knows um, and understands what's going on. And so these communication efforts are really important to taking the science and getting it into the hands of the community members and the stakeholders. Emily, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. We really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. So as you know, AGU TV tours some of the very best organizations throughout the world doing exciting, cutting edge scientific work. So let's begin this year's show in California at UC Berkeley. CIDA stands for Cooperative Institute for Dynamic Earth Research. So CIDA is a collaborative institute without walls, uh, which brings together solid earth geoscientists across 
generations and across disciplines uh, in order to together help improve our understanding of the Earth's present dynamics and its past history. One of the centerpieces of CIDER is a summer program which lasts four to six weeks and, um, and consists of uh, one part which is a tutorial part for graduate students and postdocs and then followed by two weeks in which uh, the students get together in groups with faculty, with more senior scientists, um, to work to start doing research on some multidisciplinary topics that have been defined during the two weeks of lectures. Certainly one of the issues that CIDR accomplishes is in fact defining major challenges that require a variety of disciplines to contribute to. And so, you know, each of us in our own way will contribute to problems uh, within the spheres of our own influence and expertise. And what CIDR does is it puts together a, a variety of different people with different perspectives, uh, different points of view and different understandings to really identify what are the major stumbling blocks, obstacles for making progress on important questions and then really help sharpen and focus the problems that we're actually trying to solve. I think the tools people develop at CIDR are two types. One is some level of self-confidence that even though something is not in your field it's approachable and understandable and that you're comfortable with reaching out to people in those fields and engaging in a discussion and some research. Uh, the second thing is a deeper appreciation about your own science, that by explaining it to people in other fields and working with people in other fields, you learn to better understand what you do. Typically when we teach a class, there's a lecturer and then there's a group of students. At CIDR we have many people sitting in the room who have expertise in the same topic that is being discussed. And so that means there's an active and quite vibrant discussion about the material. We conduct our summer programs either at KITP in Santa Barbara or at UC Berkeley. So the KITP is the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics uh, here at the campus of University of California, Santa Barbara. Our main goal is bringing scientists together from all over the world, about half of them from outside the U.S., for prolonged periods of interaction. So what CIDR has always been doing here and every other summer for many years is bringing together researchers to then explain to younger graduate students the impact of, of what's happening within the field. My first CIDR was in 2011 at UC Berkeley and then uh, I've participated three times since then. The last two times were here at UC Santa Barbara uh, after I moved here as a faculty member. I think CIDR has been very influential in our community uh, because it's focused on young scientists, it's focused on graduate students and postdocs primarily, and then senior participants such as myself come along to give lectures. But I have to say that I have learned so much uh, attending CIDR because I learn about all the work that's being done in related disciplines that I might not follow in the literature. So CIDR is a great melting pot, really, uh, because you have quite senior scientists, quite junior scientists. Um, hopefully it breaks down any barriers, you know, any uh, intimidation that junior scientists might feel um, in terms of talking to a senior colleague, uh, because everybody's together. And, um, and I think it, it really succeeds quite well in, in opening up those lines of communication. CIDR's greatest legacy is that it has trained young scientists in how to do collaborative cross-disciplinary research. I can recognize a student who went to CIDR. They think differently, they work differently, they work across disciplines, they have international collaborations, and they're not shy to move in new research directions. I think one of the great accomplishments of CIDR has been the training of a really a generation of young scientists that are interested in pursuing interdisciplinary research. They're more comfortable with those ideas, they're more comfortable with crossing disciplinary boundaries to pursue important problems, and I think this has been probably one of the major outcomes of the CIDR program so far. Hi, my name is Odette Aronson. 
I'm a professor and the director of the Center for Planetary Sciences here at the Weizmann Institute. The center brings together researchers from various aspects of planetary science. We have geochemistry, we have atmospheric dynamics, members of the center coming from all over the world to do research here. The center enables such collaborations by not only bringing together the relevant researchers, but also supporting them financially. And we're very proud to have this ability because it not only fosters new research here in Israel, but also enables us to have educational programs. The center runs Israel's first graduate program in planetary science for both Israeli and international students wanting to gain expertise in research into exoplanets, paleoclimates, and the solar system. We study other planets. Sometimes we do this by simulations in the lab. Sometimes we have numerical models running on computers. And occasionally, when we're lucky, we even have spacecraft that reach these other worlds. One such spacecraft is called Space IL. Space IL is the first Israeli mission to the moon. The Space IL spacecraft will not only reach the moon and land on the moon, it will make measurements of the magnetic field of the moon and help reveal the origin of that magnetic field. The main goal of the Space IL project is to inspire and educate young people, both in Israel and throughout the world about space, space science, and exploring space through planetary missions. I'm standing on top of the Telescope Observation Tower on Weizmann's campus, and I wanted to take this opportunity not just to share with you the beautiful view of Weizmann's campus, but also to show you the moon, and to show you where it is that Space IL, the first Israeli spacecraft to the moon, where it is that we will land. We plan to land here on the Mare surfaces of the moon, and location in Mare Serentatis, right between Apollo 15 and Apollo 17 on the boundary of the Mare. The center also contributes to and receives data from international space missions with ESA and NASA. For me, one of the most exciting aspects of the Center for Planetary Science is our involvement in international space missions, such as Juno and JUICE. My group studies atmospheric dynamics of planetary bodies in the solar system. We study dynamics on Earth, of course, on other terrestrial planets, and on giant planets. Giant planets have very deep atmospheres, which extend deep into the interior, and we use various methods to study how deep they extend and what kind of dynamics we can find on these planets. As part of the Juno science team, we use very accurate gravity measurements that we receive from the spacecraft and use these to interpret the wind fields on the planet. Using this method, we've been able to determine the depth of Jupiter's atmosphere. The Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer, JUICE, is a European mission to the Jovian system. For JUICE, we're contributing an instrument built here in Israel that will allow us to measure very accurately a time it takes a radio beam to travel from Jupiter to Earth, and with that, we will be able to measure the properties of the atmosphere of Jupiter. State-of-the-art facilities support research at the center, including the development of the Wiseman Fast Astronomical Survey Telescope, or WFAST, designed to observe the far reaches of our solar system. The WFAST project is a project aimed at finding, for the first time, the yet unseen part of our own solar system, the Oort Cloud, using a two very wide field of view 57 centimeter telescope to be located in Mitzpera Mon Israel in the south of the Negev Desert. Each telescope will be capable of observing thousands of stars simultaneously and to look for the minute occultations due to the passages of small rocks in our own solar system in front of uh, background stars. The Oort Cloud was never seen before. If we will find it, we will be able for the first time to detect some of the oldest bodies in our solar system, characterize them, and to have some new clues regarding the formation of the, our planetary system. Experimental geochemistry is used at the center to simulate environments which either no longer exist, like early Earth and its oceans, or environments on different planets, like Mars, which are difficult to access. We simulate those environments in the lab by controlling the temperature and the uh, gas phase chemistry and the aqueous chemistry to try and understand the processes occurring in those environments. The climate and chemistry at a planet's surface are tightly coupled. The concentration of greenhouse gases in a planet's atmosphere controls the uh, planet's climate and therefore its potential to host life. And we study these interactions. We study the ways in which the sources and sinks of various atmospheric compounds control the greenhouse effect on a planet and therefore its climate. We're standing here in the cold room uh, at the Weizmann Institute where we simulate large-scale processes as they occur on Mars. In this chamber over here, we call this our Mars chamber, we can run experiments where we can study how water diffuses from the atmosphere through the regolith under Mars atmospheric pressure and temperature and atmospheric composition 
down into the regolith to form the subsurface ice on Mars. The Simulated Planetary Ices and Environments Laboratory contributes to my research in that it allows me to build and design my own experiments to study these fundamental processes. I chose to come to the Weizmann Institute of Science for a variety of reasons, but probably the most important factors were the large range of people that I could work with and their expertise my access to state-of-the-art facilities, and also my ability to have autonomy in the science that I wanted to perform. The center explores exoplanets, planets beyond our solar system, with the aim of gaining greater knowledge of their architecture and that of our own solar system. Exoplanets are perhaps the most exciting intellectual discovery that humanity has made recently in astronomy. Here in the lab, we study specific aspects of exoplanets by looking at transit timing variations, looking at the passage of the planet in front of its host star and studying how those transits, how those occultations vary in time. This provides information on the size of the planet but also on the masses of other planets in the system. We can study the system architecture and ask questions such as is our own solar system unique or is it commonplace throughout the universe. What I really hope the center will do is continue to bring together researchers from throughout the world here to the Weizmann Institute to not only study the planets, but to also allow students to become expert in this discipline. In the Arctic, uh, you are faced with a harsh environment and a very sparse infrastructure. People living in the Arctic or working in the Arctic has to provide solutions which they can rely on. The Technical University of, of Denmark have a long history of presence in the Arctic. We try to bring together these Arctic researchers across these various institutes to create innovative solutions. We call it the Arctic Didu. Our research involves development of technologies that fit the context of the Arctic. We're looking at the challenges that come from human uh, inhabitation of the Arctic area. For example, for wastewater treatment, we have been developing UV treatment of wastewater for removal of uh, bacteria and chemicals. With the Arctic construction, people tend to think that it's the cold climate that's a big challenge. But it's the extreme climate more than cold climate. That's a real challenge in the Arctic. It's windy, it's raining, snowing. We're doing measurements on newer buildings in Greenland. We measure moisture and uh, temperature and indoor climate so we can see what impact we have from different climatic conditions. In the Arctic, you will have snow accumulated for a very long time. We are investigating snow accumulation uh, through wind tunnel testing, so this is the first step. To verify our wind tunnel model, we have installed a cube in the city of Nuuk, where we observe and we measure the weather conditions. We can use the scaling laws we have then established to look at building shapes, at building arrangements, the influence of terrain. Greenland is 100% uh, dependent of fossil fuels. If we introduce uh, renewables, this must uh, survive uh, the Arctic conditions. Our work here from DGU has been the driver for installing a wind turbine. This uh, wind turbine is designed for extreme winds up to 65 meters per second. The knowledge we do have here at the university impact uh, everyday life of people living in the Arctic, but of course also the knowledge we have on climate change. We try to combine and coordinate research in the air, at the ground and actually also at the sea. 25% of the northern hemisphere is affected by permafrost. Global permafrost has been warming over the past decade. Thawing permafrost results in, um, in a change in the mechanical properties of the soil and that can result in damages to the infrastructure and buildings that are located in that area. DTU is part of uh, an EU project called Dunatayuk. Uh, this project looks at uh, climate change impacts on Arctic coastal communities. 
We're looking at a community called Iluliset to model uh, the change in, in permafrost conditions over the coming decades for this particular community and to get uh, an idea of how permafrost may change under different climate change scenarios. My role in the EU project Nudotaric is to look at the fate of, of uh, permafrost organic carbon in the sea. Where does the carbon go? Is it staying in its organic form, i.e. just being washed out and diluted in the, in the world's ocean essentially? Or is it being turned into carbon dioxide by microbes in the sea? A lot of the work is about gathering water samples for us to find out what's where and what the conditions are. Uh, but we also carry out uh, degradation experiments. How fast can microbes in seawater degrade this organic matter and turn it into CO2? We're also using this uh, organic carbon as a tracer for ocean circulation and changes in ocean circulation. It is very important that we understand the feedback mechanisms from the warmer climate. How much water is running out on the ice sheet and what is the volume of that? Eventually it ends up in the oceans and gives us around the world uh, uh, an increasing sea level. We use a lot of uh, satellite information for measuring the, the sea ice extent and we can monitor changes uh, in it. We are primarily working with the European Space Agency. They have a, a cryosphere satellite called Cryosat 2. Our prime work is to do validation of these satellite measurements by using airborne measurements. We are getting a higher resolution when we are closer to the ground. We are flying in about 300 meters above the surface, so we get some uh, real accurate measurements. We also need some information on land, uh, so uh, we have put up GPS stations where we can monitor changes in, in the bedrock, in the heights. When we have less ice sheet, less mass, then it will actually uh, increase. Finally, we use uh, measurements from the gravity field mission GRACE, where we can actually determine the mass changes that happens with the ice sheet. We develop Arctic solutions, new insights and innovative way of working in the Arctic. And at the same time, we use that knowledge to train our students. We have a Bachelor of Engineering Education. The first three semesters are in Greenland, where the students focus on field work, we also have a master's education called uh, Extreme Engineering and Cold Climate Engineering. The students are spending at least one semester in Greenland. We also have project families. Here students work on an individual basis on their projects, but around a common topic. They get the chance to discuss with each other, so they develop more and get better results. The work that we do in the Arctic and our presence in the Arctic results in, in engineering solutions that are tailored for these extreme conditions. These solutions have an impact on climate change discussions across the scientific communities today, but also have an impact on the environmental protections of the Arctic as a well. whole. Make sure you follow us on Twitter to keep up with all the March meeting news and feel free to join in the conversation. We're absolutely delighted this year to be joined by a very special AGU TV correspondent, Heidi Roop. Now she's at Lisa Jackson's keynote address to hear from Apple's Vice President of the Environment, Policy and Social Initiatives. Hi, I'm Dr. Heidi Roop, AGU TV correspondent, and we're here at the AGU Presidential Forum with Lisa P. Jackson, Vice President of Environment, Policy, and Social Initiatives at Apple. Climate change is here, and it's altering our planet right in front of our eyes. It's truth you can see and feel. During the course of her plenary, New Orleans native Lisa Jackson discussed how Hurricane Katrina impacted her life and perspective on climate change. She goes on to discuss the work that Apple is doing in renewable energy, such as how all Apple stores and offices run entirely on renewable energy, and Apple's efforts to soon only work with 100% recyclables. When a group of thoughtful individuals representing many viewpoints, scientific disciplines, and life experiences get into a room, something really special happens. Well, actually, science happens. And we think science is very special. Lisa encourages other companies and countries to follow Apple's lead on a completely renewable global supply chain.
Bear was set up with the goal to provide an environment for people to, to do research that was you know, flexible and you know, non-bureaucratic. Over the years, we've grown from you know, one to now 125. Other people have found it useful and that the goal is to keep you know, in providing that environment for them and help them with their research. While I was doing my PhD at Boston University, I was working with a number of groups who were uh, deeply involved in NASA's Earth Observing Systems uh, science mission development. And that kind of paved the way for me to come into NASA Ames, which was doing pioneering work in processing large amounts of satellite data and the high performance computing division using the Pleiades supercomputer. And that was my natural inclination to come here. NEX is NASA Earth Exchange. We created this platform almost five years back to enable researchers and scientists to come and use the NASA supercomputing platform where we actually store all the satellite data sets and give access to computing at scale. And NASA has a lot of satellites up in orbit and they're streaming in real-time data, which are really large. The whole motive was for NEX was to store all this data in one centralized location and then give access to the compute next to it. So researchers spend 80% of their time downloading and pre-processing data, but spend 20% of their time in doing real science. Now, NEX wanted to reverse this, and the main challenge for us was to create these unified workflows where researchers can come in and use these workflows to replicate what has been already done. So the value add that NASA Earth Exchange brings to the table is with processing all these data sets and creating these high-level insights, this, is, this can be of direct value to the first responders. And blending the geostationary satellites and the polar satellites, now you have a way to merge these platforms together and give you almost real-time information that can be harnessed by different vendors for actually responding to fire events, to forest fires, to hurricane tracking, you name it. The NASA Student Airborne Research Program, or SARP, is a summer internship program for undergraduate juniors who are majoring in any of the science, technology, engineering, or math disciplines. They get to come out to California and fly on board one of our NASA research aircraft and do Earth System Science research. These students are studying um, chemistry, biology, math, computer science, and they come out to California and they get to fly on board one of our NASA research aircraft, which is such a unique experience for an undergrad. They get to do a project from end to end, from collecting the data in the field and on board the aircraft, to analyzing and interpreting that data in the lab and um, back on their computers, and then um, presenting their results and conclusions um, in front of an audience of um, their peers as well as um, fellow NASA scientists and um, from across the country. And the really great thing about SARP is that we um, allow students to be able to see that they can take the background that they have now and apply that to the study of the Earth system. We have some students who come in, say, as a physics major, and they think that they're going to do astrophysics, which is great. Um, but after they do our program, they realize that this physics background that they have, they can use that to study the Earth system. They can become an expert in remote sensing. And so we'll have students that um, come into our program thinking that they're going to go on one track and then completely change their mind and end up applying to graduate schools um, in fields relevant to the Earth system. We're grateful for the support this program has received from across NASA. Many different NASA scientists and administrators have come out to California to inspire our students. Our students have gotten to fly on the NASA DC-8, the P-3, the Sherpa, the B-200, and have used data from the ER-2. So I'm a field scientist, and um, I came to NASA because I was really interested in planetary science and the merger with that and human spaceflight. Um, and so I really wanted to integrate the worlds of science and human exploration together, and there's no better place to do that than here. And Bayer was a wonderful opportunity in terms of a portal or an enabling factor to actually make this research come to fruition. The SALT stands for Biologic Analog Science Associated with Lava Terrains. And this project is focused on the integration of real geological and biological science with the human spaceflight community. And so we've been going out into the field in Idaho and Hawaii to conduct field research that's focused on habitability studies in these volcanic terrains, in basalt-rich terrains, which are great analogs or point of comparisons um, for Mars. 
and then we use that environment to learn, to understand what it's going to take to actually conduct extravehicular activities or EVAs on places like Mars when you have humans separated from the Earth, not only um, through space but also through time. What we're trying to do with all of the projects that I'm involved with is really bridge the gap between exploration and science and make sure that the conversation around the capabilities, the operational concepts that are developed for future human spaceflight, for example to Mars, are infused, that conversation is infused right now with science because eventually we want the humans that are on the surface of Mars to conduct science and exploration and we have to build and design for that now. As a researcher, there's so much coming at you. And as well, I'm a field researcher, so I constantly go into what are called extreme environments. And I need to know that at home, you know, basically there's an engine at work to ensure that I'm protected, that I'm supported in every which way when it comes to just being able to have a life and to be a field scientist and a scientist in general. And Bayer really offers me that, that, that capability and that support mechanism. The Party Center is unique among the different interdisciplinary centers that we have at Boston University because the topics that it works on are not defined by a particular topic area, uh, but rather they're defined by a length of time. It's the Party Center for the Longer Range Future. I think it's a great place because it's not housed in any individual department. It's its own center, which means that people can come from many different disciplines and feel like they're on an even playing field. Being in the physical party center here at 67 Bay State, it's not only a beautiful historic building on one of the most beautiful streets in Boston, but it's also a exciting place to be. I can come here and work closely with economists, psychologists, political scientists, on problems that really require these multiple perspectives if there's any hope of addressing them. So the party center is really organized around the principle that that the most important thing that we can do is to catalyze research on, pro on problems that matter. Water issues, climate change, biodiversity, conservation, all that stuff that's all really, really relevant now is going to be relevant into the future. And all of the faculty, you know, they're not an insular group. They're not all just trying to do their own thing and maximize their own benefit, right? They want their work to make a difference. So I convened a symposium on global health and the social sciences with Party last year. Uh, Party's support very generously brought together uh, over 20 leading social scientists from anthropology, political science, and sociology to discuss the problem of why we see so little global health research in the social sciences and what can be done about it. And uh, it was an exciting moment because I think it really galvanized interest in global health in the social sciences. So one of the projects here at the Party Center that I lead is looking at how human activities have altered the global nitrogen cycle. So we know from many studies that rates of nitrogen that's falling from the atmosphere have been declining, which is a good thing in many places. But here in Boston and other cities, um, those rates of what we call nitrogen deposition are actually still quite high. So our project here at the Party Center is we're trying to understand what's causing those rates of nitrogen in deposition to be high and what can we do to mitigate those effects and work with policymakers so that we can improve upon our water quality and air quality as well. I lead a program here on coupled human and natural systems and our goal is to take all the tools in the toolkit, modeling, empirical science on the ground and in the water, and policy instruments, and work together to basically invent things that we call adaptive management um, ecosystem-based management. It's the whole system view of our role on the planet and ways to ensure our future survival. Another part of the center's activities is a program we do for BU graduate students in the summer, our Summer Fellows Program. The Graduate Summer Fellows Program is really unique uh, to the Party Center. Uh, it's an intensive 10-week program in which uh, graduate students, master's students, and doctoral students are chosen on a competitive basis. And it allows students to work with colleagues from all across the university. 
I decided to apply for the Summer Graduate Fellowship here at the Pardee Center because I wanted the opportunity to have a start, middle, and end to my own research project. Um, I was responsible for designing it and executing it and then creating a final product on deadline. I think this fellowship really opened my eyes to the importance of sharing what we do in the, the halls of academia with people outside, um, especially in the policy realm. So a big part of the Party Center's rationale, our, our reason for being here, uh, is to make sure that we reach out to audiences beyond the university audiences, beyond the scholarly community. So we do that a couple of different ways for events, for seminars, for workshops, for conferences. So we've had uh, people like uh, Rosina Bierbaum, Bob Watson, uh, and Tom Lovejoy, uh, one of the world-renowned conservationists. For publications, we have two publication series that we run ourselves. And one of those is uh, are short pieces, about 3,500 words, they're policy briefs. We also have a second series we call the party papers or working papers, and they're a longer research piece. And we try to make sure they end up in the hands of decision-making communities and stakeholders who actually have some kind of res some responsibility for the issues that each of these uh, papers looks at. The Party Center provides actionable recommendations that are backed by the full body of relevant knowledge. So if, if you want your money to lead to action, but you want it to be based on hard science and, and demonstrable truth, this is where you want to come. can be said that we are all in space, so you can do many things just within this department. You can get great education, you can do um, top-notch computing, uh, working with uh, the largest supercomputers in the world, and you can also tackle the, the greatest societal problems that we have related to pollution or climate change. So in a way, this building is a universe of its own. I really like being here in the Climate and Space Sciences and Engineering Department at Michigan because we're a really big space physics group. I specialize in numerical simulations of magnetic solar eruptions. I specialize mostly working on comets. I specialize in biosphere-atmosphere interactions. And I uh, study solar wind and particles that are carried in solar wind. My specialty is the origin and evolution of the planetary atmospheres and planetary habitability. Well, one of the strengths that, that we have here in the department is that we uh, span across science and engineering, and that's a great asset to our students because they learn the scientific foundations, but they, they can also learn about uh, engineering. So being a student in the College of Engineering means you have access to a lot of like laboratory tools and computing resources to do, essentially, to do the things that you're learning about in class not only for students, you know, success, but also for faculty. I think, I think having access to the scientific expertise and engineering expertise available within the College of Engineering, I think is vital to the success of this department. We're more than 50 years into the space age, and we still have some real fundamental mysteries about the sun. Really like to understand what the sun is doing that's so good at heating things to high temperatures. Those high temperatures lead to this supersonic solar wind. Um, and that can have societal effects at Earth that can disrupt communications, radar, GPS. So we want to understand the underlying basic physics uh, and we'll better understand our universe. We also want to be able to predict whether these space weather events can uh, harm society. Michigan has a very long history of numerical modeling for space weather. We uh, are the developers of the BATS R Us, which is a, a code, which is a big uh, fluid, magneto fluid code and has been coupled with other codes in this larger uh, system called the Space Weather Modeling Framework. So Space Weather Modeling Framework is one of the leading numerical modeling framework in the world for space weather research. Um, our nearest space environment is a very complicated system, so only modeling framework like Space Weather Modeling fr Framework will be able to capture the coupling and the feedback in the system. I have the belief that um, 
scientific solutions are, are probably one of the most impactful ways that we can um, protect our environment and, and also improve our relationship with the environment. And I think that one of the best ways to do that uh, that's relevant to the world today is through climate science. So my work in atmospheric dynamics does encompass understanding tropical phenomena like the Madden-Julian oscillation, El Nino, and tropical waves. And I do simple theoretical uh, derivations. And with this improved conceptual understanding, we can use model analysis and observations to see what these systems are, and then go back and try to improve our theoretical understanding. I study how ice sheets and glaciers are changing in response to past, present, and future climate change. And it's been interesting over the past decade or two because we've seen changes that we've never seen before in Antarctica. We saw ice sheets change in ways that we didn't expect, that models didn't predict. So the Larsen B ice shelf, which had been stable for 10,000 years, in 2002, it completely disintegrated over about six weeks. And so we're seeing these very dramatic changes that we're still trying to understand. I chose CLASP when I came in here because there is a wide variety of research interests that are represented by faculty in the department. Right now, for instance, I'm looking at atmospheric dynamics, so the high pressure systems that I'm looking at. You know, I can talk to dynamicists in the department like Christian Jablonowski, for instance. So my research looks at variable resolution measures. So what we mean, we zoom into the region of interest with very high resolution measures that gives us fine scaling. And then we can really resolve features like the thunderstorm structure in a hurricane. Um, one other aspect is, uh, well, we can put these meshes statically over a region of interest or we can also let these meshes move and we call that adaptive mesh refinement. And that is a very sophisticated way of tracking a feature as it evolves and moves. And I will be a, a basically a beneficiary of measurements that um, we are taking here in this department, the Cygnus mission for example. And so Cygnus is the first of its kind mission. It's a, a constellation of small satellites in low Earth orbit to measure the winds and hurricanes. And it's the first time that NASA is essentially subcontracting out the management of the entire mission outside of the NASA infrastructure and letting a university run the entire mission, which is what we're doing now. And all of those things are um, motivated by trying to expand the community of people that do space missions. And We've been pretty successful at it so far. What we do in, my, in our group, for example, is we've designed an environmental chamber where we can actually simulate the Martian atmosphere, the near-surface Martian atmosphere, in terms of temperature, pressure, and humidity. And especially with the humidity part, this is one of the few in the world that can do that in the entire range of the Martian conditions. And we use that to also develop instrumentation. Um, we are calibrating the current relative humidity sensor for the Mars Science Laboratory, Curiosity, and we're also working on calibrating the relative humidity sensor for the upcoming Mars 2020 mission. Yeah, so Mars 2020 will take uh, like the next step by seeking, by not only seeking uh, past habitable conditions, but also by seeking past microbial life itself. And so. The study of the planetary atmospheres is extremely important, not just for our own solar system, but for the new planets that we are discovering, especially the, uh, the habitable zone planets, but also big planets like Jupiter and Jupiter-sized planets that we're discovering in other solar systems. It's amazing to see just like just the whole breadth of problems that we still haven't fully understood, you know, and like how we're still able to kind of like grasp the essence of these things and like communicate them uh, to the public, you know. Mm -hmm. And that, and I, I think that too, to me, is uh, one of the amazing things about climate science. I think uh, the challenge of space exploration really inspired uh, students to get excited about technology and coming up with new innovative solutions. That's how we develop new technology, new ideas, just dreaming and then going after that dream. Delighted now to be talking about the AGU Centennial with uh, Tim Grove. Tim, welcome. Thank you, Steve. Lovely to see you today. Thank you for joining us. Nice to see you. So we're talking about the Centennial. So tell us a little, give us a flavor of what's uh, going on to mark the Centennial. There is a lot of stuff going on right now. And, and I'm the chair of the Centennial Steering Committee. And so I'm aware of a lot of it, but there's so much going on that I can't possibly <laughs> remember it all. 
but there's a lot going on in publications. Um, there are a number of um, papers and volumes being put together in the various disciplines about um, the exciting stuff that's going on in our science and also what the future problems and directions are that we need to solve. And there's stuff going on in the meeting, of course, all around us today. There are things happening in museums and, and other places off-site for AGU as well as, as here. And also, we now have a um, fund that you can um, you can apply to if you as a member want to do some uh, propose and, and carry out some kind of a centennial activity and that's happening right now and people we're encouraging people to apply to it so yeah. when you're talking about uh, members can uh, uh, apply to the fund how do you think uh, that being a hundred matters to uh, individual members well you know what it, I think that that 100 should matter to all of us because you know we've been around now for 100 years and we're an extremely vibrant um, and active and successful scientific organization that I think is really starting to make a change and what we need to do is we need to take that forward into the future and so everybody should be thinking about that and it's not like we have to do things new you know we're already doing a lot of really good stuff the science that we do is really exciting. We're discovering all kinds of new things um, outside of our planet and within and, our, and underneath our feet. Uh, we need to continue doing that. We need to be excellent communicators of what that science is and how it can help um, society and, and the general public um, work better in the world that we all have to live in and, and coexist with it. So the 100 years, and you talked about uh, the importance of communicating. Uh, how important is it that uh, the society uses the centennial to uh, look to the future and to communicate, as you say, a lot of the work that's uh, going on at the moment? Well, like I was saying, we're, you know, the, I don't think the future is anything magic. I think we just need to focus on doing the things that the organization does well. We got a great strategic plan. It involves outreach. It involves science and society. It involves just excellence in science. It involves talent pool. These are all the things we need to carry forward. And the work that the society does, the work that uh, you all do, is so pivotal, isn't it, to society right now? It is. It's of absolutely critical importance, you know, and we've had some successes in, um, in applying our science to solve big, big problems, you know, and things like the ozone hole, we need to need to move that forward to all the other challenges that we're going to be facing in the future. Well, Tim, thank you very much indeed for uh, joining us today. Really appreciate You're it. You're welcome, thank you. Steve. Thanks. SSP is the culmination of 50 years of research, entrepreneurship, and um, academic innovations. The department creates educational and research activity aimed at a sustainable earth system and still with a prosperous economy. So how do we do that? We, we, have, we train our students in an interdisciplinary uh, training that combines the social science and the natural science. So they get an horizontal approach of every issues and we integrate that into three degrees that we propose in the program. We propose a Master of Science, a Master of Environmental Management and a PhD. The graduate program has been designed to provide an integrated and creative learning environment that fosters intellectual growth, critical thinking and practical engagement in research and sustainable management of earth and resources. Our faculty do research on topics that are related to earth systems and the sustainability of earth system. And we have research on the glaciology and water resources. We have faculty working on environmental and natural economics, on environmental science and policy, on climate change and the impact of climate change on the hydrology, and the optical oceanography using remote sensing. Uh, in the aquatic environment. We have also faculty working on uh, renewable energy, the biomass side of it, and also on uh, ecosystem, forest ecosystems. 
I examine different methods we use to translate environmental science into the policy process and how we communicate it with society. Over the past 10 years, I have conducted a series of surveys with uh, local officials across the Great Plains states. And I asked them, are they concerned about climate change? And if so, what is their office doing to address it? A little less than half of the survey respondents were concerned about climate change at the time. And less than 20% had developed any policies to address mitigation or adaptation. But one respondent really highlighted an important component that changed my research. The more we argue about who causes climate change or what causes it, we're wasting time and energy because the public will continue to struggle to understand the complexities. They really highlight the factor that framing climate change is just as important as looking at the science of what's causing it and how to change that. One real world issue now is the devil's Lake flooding. And this devil's flooding is, is not only water and also about water quality. And so we involve the student, conduct multidisciplinary research, we collect water sample in the lab, we analyze water sample for water pollution, and we conduct modeling so to simulate how this water would respond to climate change. And also we did additional research like in policy. What the policy would, should be implemented to mitigate this with the minimal environmental effect. And also we conduct economic analysis to see what the current measures in mitigating this Devil's Lake flooding, do they make economic sense? Or if it doesn't make sense, what could be the alternative? Even though we use geospatial data to conduct uh, the research on the glaciers to give us a broader sense of the changes that are occurring in, in a larger region, it's still important to get into the field because the geospatial data, the imagery and, or the digital elevation models can't necessarily provide all of the information that we need to understand what's happening with the glacier and how it's impacting and being impacted by the environment. We absolutely get students involved in our research. We find that it's really important to bring students into the field. There are a number of things that need to be done, the ice radar, the GPS, the stream flow. So there's a number of people that need to be involved in this research. Being in the field for them really gives them a sense as to what is actually happening out in the real world. I teach environmental economics and their ecological economics across all campers, um, both in undergraduate and graduate classes. And that attract many students from different fields, including biology, geography, political science, language, as well as students from engineering school. I think it's very important for them to um, be able to use economic way of thinking to analyze those environmental issues and uh, help them to understand understand what exactly caused those environmental issues and how the policy can correct those um, uh, mechanisms to um, incentivize people to make sustainable and good decision makings. We ideally are looking for people that are able to think in interdisciplinary ways. Galileo was not the first person to point a telescope at the moon. That honor goes to an individual that was in England. And he took the telescope and he pointed it at the moon and he made a sketch of it and he described it as a perfect sphere. But when Galileo pointed his telescope at the moon, he saw mountains and craters. He saw this really varied world and it was because of the, the environment that Galileo was living in at the time. So that diversity of experience that he had because of his environment allowed him to make a critical insight about the moon when he saw it. That for me is the most important thing for students, to bring what they know about the world and apply it to different fields. Arctic ecosystems are extremely important for the climate as such, for us to document the changes that we are now seeing happening as a consequence of climate change. 
The Arctic Research Center and Aarhus University Department of Biosciences is a place where we have gathered a wide range of world experts in the Greenland Ecosystem Monitoring Program that has now been operating for 25 years, measuring uh, well over 1,000 environmental parameters year after year. We are investigating the impacts of climate change on ecosystems through our monitoring of the dynamics in the ecosystems. And we are seeing changes, we are seeing changes relating to temperature, permafrost, thaw. We are also seeing it in relation to sea ice decline. So there are a lot of those parameters that we are measuring continuously that are showing signs of impact from climate change already. I'm interested in understanding the link between physical changes, chemical and biological changes in the ocean. We don't know very much on what happens in the currents around Greenland. So what we're trying to find out there is actually what is the water masses and how does it fit into the more global picture. And that's kind of important to know because if you change the currents there, it may result in either you get warmer water into the glaciers that get in contact with Greenland ice sheet so it can melt, or it may kind of buffer it. So we are developing equipment that can, we can leave out there for a whole year and then transmit the data directly into our computers and then take out the data. I combine three different methods, you can say, sort of traditional community-based functional ecology. We look at which species are in an area, uh, how much do they cover and how do they interact with each other. The second approach is dendroecological approach, where we dig out the shrubs, we cut them over and we count how old they are and assess variation in, in cell sizes. But for understanding the magnitude of these changes, we need other tools. So there we are using drones, the newest technology on sensors and satellites to upscale the local information across the landscape. And when we have upscaled that across the landscape, we can start building models that tells us something about what would be the potential changes into the future. In the case of my work, we are mainly focusing on the top of the ecosystem because we are dealing with relations in climate change, but also the effect of the contaminants in these uh, top predators. The major goal is to uh, reduce the contaminant loads of these uh, animals. So we are investigating uh, the exposure, which eventually, eventually gets into the Inuit population. And uh, in the cases where we can document that these substances are increasing, that they're biomagnifying, and that they have a health effect, then we are in dialogue with conventions like the Stockholm Convention trying to mitigate these substances on the international level so that the entire world's population get a lower exposure of these various contaminants. But we can talk about that this region actually has an early action warning because we have so high concentrations. In the Arctic, a number of sort of ecological processes is uh, going at a slower pace because of the cold climate, because of the darkness during winter, because of the ice cover, and that makes the Arctic ecosystems often more sensitive, but also sensitive in a different way than in more temperate areas. And we're looking into that so we can help by research to predict what's going on when you have industrial development in the Arctic. We are very much focused on some of the old mines in Greenland, where mining was done in the last century and where in some places the pollution was uh, pretty heavy. We are sort of using these old mining areas as test areas for developing methods for monitoring pollution and also with the effects of pollution. And these new methods we're using as tools in setting up monitoring programs uh, where new mines is established. The Panama Bioscience is really unique. We are embedded in this network of scientists we have the knowledge on all compartments of ecosystems, the bios, the geos, the cryosphere, and we have, the, we have knowledge on the new technologies, are the skills to apply them and understand the changes. We are working more and more in multidisciplinary projects where we're also working together with uh, anthropologists and uh, socio-economic people. And we are also uh, increasingly working together with uh, local stakeholders. The Aarhus University has a long tradition for measurement in Greenland. 
actually one of the longest ecosystem data sets from the Arctic. But we also formed something called the Arctic Science Partnership, where we are six countries working very strongly together on all these Arctic uh, issues, not only around Greenland, but on a pan-Arctic scale. We are working within the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, where we are actually working together with all the eight Arctic countries, embracing all the questions that is uh, important to the change in the ecosystem and the exposure of contaminants. International collaboration is important. We cannot tell what is happening in the Arctic as a whole without looking at the circumpolar north. We need to put what we are measuring in Greenland into a perspective which is arising of course from the whole of the Arctic picture. This is the way in which we can tell the rest of the Earth and the globe what is actually the impact of changes in the Arctic. We investigate the growth of continents and supercontinents from the mechanical point of view. We focus, namely, on the most recent supercontinent, Pangaea, that is best preserved and where the processes of continental construction can be depicted. There are two main and contrasting areas. The western interior European part that was formed by amalgamation of Gondwana-derived continental fragments to the northern continental landmass and the exterior Eastern Asian part where giant oceanic domain was incorporated into the host of supercontinent. This oceanic lithosphere was neither abducted nor subducted but remained landlocked in between continental blocks. In both cases the continental grow was consolidated by a lower crustal flow of exotic material called relamination. The Center for Lithospheric Research is a department of the Czech Geological Survey, which is a state research institute. Our main task is to provide expertise in geosciences to the Czech government, but at the same time we are engaged in basic research. Our support to basic research creates environment where both research and applied expertise can thrive together and enhances our competences. In 2011, the Czech Ministry of Education opened a funding scheme for high-flying Czech researchers with career abroad to establish new research teams within Czech institutions. Karel Schulman, a professor from Strasbourg University, took this opportunity and succeeded. The centre concentrates world-class research in our survey, collaborates with experts from other departments and is also very active on the international scene. In order to develop conceptual models of continental grow, we start with the fieldwork. It involves outcrop scale structural analysis on vast regions accompanied with geological and geophysical mapping. This analysis is completed by micro-scale investigations allowing us to determine pressure and temperature conditions, their ages and conditions of deformation. In that way, we can construct the dynamic and kinematic model for the given portions of the lithosphere. These models are finally tested by geophysics, in particular potential field methods and numerical and analog modeling to determine pressure temperature conditions and age of mineral fabric it is important to select a suitable sample already in the field we observe crystallization deformation relations under optical microscope we measure mineral compositions on electron microprobe based on a horror composition we calculate the thermodynamic model which is a map of uh, equilibrium mineral assemblages. Then we trace a pressure temperature path uh, based on earlier fabric observations. The age we calculate from radiogenic isotopes on radiogenic minerals and uh, such pressure temperature deformation time path overlock. 
then serves towards building a large-scale geodynamic model. Mineral fabric uh, represents the arrangement of minerals in a rock on a microscopic scale. And properties such as grain size, uh, crystallographic preferred orientation, grain distribution, they all in a way reflect the mechanical properties or rather mechanical state of a rock during the formation. And since the mineral fabric is very closely related to metamorphic conditions and the geometry of the formation, it is extremely important to quantify and understand these properties in order to create and test reliable geodynamic scenarios or models. Gravity and magnetic data provide information about the density and magnetic susceptibility contrasts related to the juxtaposition of different rocks, as it is the case in Orogens. The main objective of potential field analysis is to enhance the location and trend of these contrasts by applying suitable filtering procedures. Then, by correlating the gravity and magnetic signatures with geological and tectonic information, we can infer the significant crystal structures, including their continuity in depth. In both Europe and Asia, Paleozoic orogenic belts the gravity data analysis and modeling contributed to assess the occurrence of rocks which originated elsewhere and then were later tectonically emplaced into their current position. In the Bohemian Massif, the 3D forward gravity modeling established a felsic Ordovician continental relaminant underneath a Devonian magmatic arc and back arc basin. In southern Mongolia, the 2D forward gravity modeling showed the existence of a Cambrian magmatic arc relaminant underneath a Devonian oceanic domain. We study relamination using numerical models. The models were developed in collaboration with ETH Zurich. There they have vast experience with the modeling of subduction and collision. In order to obtain relamination in such a model, we need to incorporate all relevant physics which means that, for example, we need to have different kinds of materials in the model to mimic the behavior of the crust and mantle and their buoyancy. Besides that, we need to take into account melting and weakening by melt. The difficult task is to find a model uh, that can explain data from natural origins and that is at the same time simple enough we can understand its dynamics. Analog modeling is exciting because you can observe development of orogenic scale structures in front of your eyes within minutes or hours. We are interested in the mechanical role of the relamination process on exhumation of the weak, partially molten lower crust in accretionary or collisional orogens. This type of modeling is done in cooperation with the Institute of Geophysics of the Academy of Sciences of Czech Republic. In this model, you can observe formation of large-scale folds cored by partially molten material that resembles development of metamorphic domes in the Central Asian orogenic belt. Our main objective is to understand uh, geodynamic evolution of accretional systems developed between the Tizian interior and Pacific exterior oceanic plates along eastern margin of supercontinent Pangaea. Here, relamination and accretion processes formed specific continental oceanic hybrid lithosphere that was later incorporated into the heart of Pangaea supercontinent. The thermomechanical aspects, the timescales and length scales of the formation and transformation of these lithospheric segments into the major continent are the main questions of modern geodynamics. The Centre of Lithospheric Research and its research partners home and abroad wishes to engage this problem in future.
The ocean hosts life and plays a major role in the complex mechanism of climate regulation. It's tremendously important to observe the oceans. They cover three quarters of the planet and there are a variety of ways in which we make those observations, from satellites to aircraft, to floats, gliders. The way that EMSO is focusing is on the fixed point observatories. The European Multidisciplinary Seafloor and Water Column Observatory, or EMSO, explores the oceans to better understand the phenomena happening within and below them, and to explain the critical role these phenomena play in the broader Earth system. This is a series of observatories which are from deep sea floor, cable observatories, standalone observatories and test sites observatories. So different depths and with a lot of sensors across the European seas, from the North Seas, across the deep sea floor in the Atlantic, entering into the Mediterranean, measuring the different essential ocean variables and in particular in the Mediterranean basin we care about the collision between the Eurasian and African plates. The fixed point observatories, which EMSO focuses on, have the great strength of carrying sensors and samplers throughout the water column and on the seabed. Monitoring physical and chemical changes in seawater enables EMSO to predict and provide data on environmental and natural hazards. Operating in areas of seismic activity, EMSO gathers data on seismic, volcanic and tsunami activity in the ocean to increase knowledge and advise civil society in responding to geohazards. The aim of EMSO EDIC is to provide to different scientific stakeholders, communities, excellent data and information. How is it affecting the Mediterranean basin? This slow increase of temperature, why the, there is a fish migration of species toward the north of Europe, how the fusion of the Arctic or Antarctic affected the sea level. They also have a role to play in the decommission of the North Sea oil and gas fields by 2025. We can help in this particular business of how is the best way to decommission, dismantling this huge platform fit to the ocean in the northern European seas. With 10 years of development, EMSO is now in a pre-operational phase. Deployed in 2009 off the coast of Barcelona in Spain, OBSI is an expandable seafloor observatory and one of EMSO's three test sites. An underwater cable observatory brings the possibility to deploy many types of instruments without power or bandwidth constraints. So in its deployment, OBSI has generated a very valuable data set, mainly physical and biological information of the area, where the community is able to test new instruments, sensors and measurement data procedures and data management protocols. EMSO will provide to the community all this accumulated experience about science, technology, engineering and data management thanks to different service groups. To deploy sensors at deep sea and transmit its data in real time is always a challenge. Seafloor observatories connected to a surface voice through a cable, inductive or acoustic communication link are the most usual. And from the sea, surface to shore, satellite links offer a limited bandwidth that implies an accurate offshore data processing in order to transmit the most valuable information. At this point, testing new technologies on EMSO test sites, like OPSI, ensure a higher success when projects go to deep sea. The, the added value of EMSO network is having standardized sensors that can be changed between the observatories if needed, and also we can coordinate the maintenance, the access to the observatories on the European level by using the European fleets, and that of course decreases the cost. The aim of EMSO is to achieve fair data, data that are very high quality and that can feed a European database. Training is a very important activity uh, within the EMSO network because uh, EMSO is observing the Earth in the long term to enlarge the observation uh, to new parameters when needed. The funding of EMSO comes from the members and from uh, specific actions which are uh, funded by the EU Horizon 2020 program for research and innovation which support the EMSO implementation towards full operation. The strength of EMSO is pulling together the European endeavours in fixed point observatories. And as a result of this, we are going to have a much better understanding of not only the way the oceans and the underlying seabed change over time, 
but also how the system works. What is the interaction between these different parts of the marine system? The vision of MSO Eric is to become a world leader in uh, observing deep sea flow and water column, providing a high resolution data set to solve problems about the interaction between the geosphere, hydrosphere and biosphere. I'm here with Denny Rousseau, AGU Fall Meeting Program Committee Chair. Welcome. Thank you. So can you tell us a little, little bit about the program and what you think is most exciting here this week at the AGU Fall Meeting? Uh, this year, ex this, uh, the excitement is uh, about uh, uh, improving uh, what, what we have done this past year, which is uh, helping the new developments of AGU like uh, the GeoHealth uh, section, which is uh, a newcomer in, the, in this program. We have also education, so we have tried to, uh, to make them uh, feeling comfortable by uh, uh, supporting their, uh, de their development with, through uh, different uh, sessions. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, um, what I am uh, very uh, fascinated is the, by the keynote lectures, because this is a very diverse, uh, uh, um, topics that uh, they, they, are, they are providing us. But I imagine that there are quite a few logistical challenges that come with uh, putting on so many sessions and multi-format engagements for those 27,000 of us here. So can you describe a little bit of what that looks oh, it's, like? Uh, it's a uh, year-long uh, work, you know. I, I'm always uh, starting uh, working on, uh, on, uh, on uh, the upcoming meeting, mostly during uh, the uh, previous fall. I already started working on the 2019 uh, meeting uh, already in, uh, in September because I think that if you want things to happen you have to prepare them uh, well in advance and uh, also what we are facing is that with the launch or, or celebration of the centennial uh, we want everything to be perfect. Otherwise, it will not be a celebration. It will be a fiasco. And uh, I don't want to be involved in a fiasco. Could you tell us a little bit more about AGU's evolution in that space and, I, and the efforts underway to really address yes, equity and inclusion know, in our community? AGU is a, is a, is a leading organization in this, uh, on this topic. And uh, not only there are words or written uh, statements but there, there is also action and uh, during this uh, meeting we have uh, seven sessions which are really dedicated to these uh, critical issues we have two town halls two regular sessions we have uh, one workshop one union session one plenary so i think that uh, is this de demonstrate that uh, really uh, agu and uh, i am supporting this as a program chair we, are, we really care about these uh, critical and very important uh, issues and uh, we do our best to show the attendees that, uh, yes, we take action and this is how AGU is. Well, fantastic. Thank you for being one of those champions of change within <laughs> AGU membership. It's really thank, important work. Thank you very much. So that's it for today, but remember, we'll be back each and every day of this fantastic meeting with yet more exclusive centennial material. In the meantime, you can watch the show all over the Conventional Centre, in your hotel room and online, as well as on the AGU4 meeting app. And don't forget to keep up with all the very latest developments and get in touch via the web. We'll see you tomorrow, AGU.